Now, just so you're clear about the format, we're going to have this final panel until about 12.25, and then I want to cut off the Q&A, or the, if, if we do have a presentation that's still going on at 12.25, we're going to have to cut it off because we will go to the next room, next door, and if you've RSVP'd for, RSVP'd for lunch, that's where we're going to take lunch, in the next room. So we will go over there, take a five-minute break, but be seated by 12.30 for lunch. We're probably going to start the luncheon keynote address by Michael Scheuer at 12.35. So I just want you to have the overall picture so you don't miss anything, because we're going to be moving fast as we close out this conference, because we have people who have to take airplanes and that sort of thing. Well, this is going to be the capstone uh, event, and it's the capstone event and the most interesting event in a sense because this whole debate over whether we are an empire has heated up so much in this post-9-11 world in which we live. And for that reason, now we'll have uh, people address the post-Cold War idea of empire, and I'd like to turn it over now to Michael Scheuer. Thank you, Mike, for moderating. Yes, sir, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me, Doctor. It's uh, an honor to be here. Uh, I don't know if anyone had the chance or everyone had the chance to see Professor Brand's uh, talk last night, uh, but I thought it was an excellent, an excellent talk. And the exhibit also is quite um, excellent at the Ford Museum. The one, the one anecdote that I always liked about Theodore Roosevelt, they, had a, they have a picture of him on the second floor in a rowboat. And they always said that that was Roosevelt's favorite uh, uh, hobby, because he could be both captain and crew uh, at the same time. And, but it, it's really a wonderful exhibit. Professor Brands last night raised in the course of his discussion um, the idea that perhaps people like Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge had too much knowledge of history, that they had uh, growing up hearing their own fathers talk about and their, their relations talking about the, their Civil War stories and how they saved the Union and defeated the Confederacy. And I believe, and Professor Brands is here, so uh, if I'm incorrect, he raised the possibility of whether several generations without a war to remember, to talk about, to pass on, would somehow bleed out the belligerence and warlike qualities of, of a society. And in opening this panel today with three very distinguished speakers, uh, I'd like for a moment just to say, I think America's predicament in the world in many ways is a good chance to examine Professor Brand's hypothesis. And sadly, the price of, of several generations of relative peace and prosperity, which the Cold War did bring us, does not seem to have bled out our, ta our taste for belligerence or war. What it seems to have done instead is to bleed out, bleed out of our polity, especially among our elites, the knowledge of American history and the nature of the struggle that has brought America from Runnymede to the year of our Lord 2005. This is a possible explanation of America's predicament that occurred to me at the time of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. I'll speak later today about why I believe the Iraq war has weakened America in its war to the knife against Islamic extremism. For now, I will only say that I oppose the Iraq war for several reasons beyond its starkly negative impact on the war on terror. First, like America's earlier war against Serbia, it was an offensive war against the country that had not attacked America. My view was and is that unprovoked offensive wars of conquest are not part of Americans' historical character, fundamental documents, or foundational documents, or basic decency. On this point, my model was uh, the reasoned opposition of Ulysses Grant and Abraham Lincoln to the war with Mexico. The second point was, again, there was no declaration of war by the Congress. This seems to me be an, to be an extraordinary ab abdication of responsibility by the legislative branch of government to let uh, the president, any president, whether it was Mr. Clinton in Serbia or Mr. Bush in uh, Iraq, go to war without the consent of the people's representatives in a formal declaration of war and not the consent of, of the Senate or the Congress. Third, and for me most important, the war aims outlined for the Iraq War, and which were endorsed, I might add, by nearly, by unanimously by nearly all in both parties, were profoundly ignorant of American history. I believe, parenthetically, that this is just as true for the Afghan War. I have long believed and believe still that U.S. leaders should not be judged too harshly for knowing only limited amounts about the history of foreign countries 
and cultures. This is a shortcoming most Americans share. So if our bipartisan leaders do not know that Iraq was the center of, and glory of Islamic civilization for 800 years, so be it. What no American can or should forgive are U.S. leaders who appear to have a decidedly limited awareness of where we have come from as a people. Building democracy in the Islamic or any other world is an admirable dream, but it is a suicidal policy. Why? Well, not because others are not capable of self-government, but because we don't have 800 years to wait for, th for them to develop the democracy. I lost my page. We enjoy and wish to perfect at base, at least in my view, our leaders, Republicans and Democrats, have set us up for defeat in Iraq, Afghanistan, and perhaps against Islamic extremism generally, because they have little knowledge of and have even less respect for the bloody, vicious, valiant, and yet unfinished struggle Americans have waged to establish and protect an enduring and equitable republic. Would any U.S. leader with a deep knowledge of America's saga save the lament lamentable Woodrow Wilson, believe that 800 years of struggle towards self-government could be condensed onto a set of CD-ROMs given to Mr. Karzai in Afghanistan, or Mr. Sistani, or Mr. Chalabi in Iraq, and be expected to be implemented in six months, a year, or 10 years. Here then lies the source of danger to America, a generation of political, academic, media, and social elites who don't know enough about their own history. Men and women intent on installing democracy in alien cultures who appear to be ignorant of the fact that Americans had 150 years of self-government in North America before the Declaration of Independence. So to end where I began, Professor Brand's challenging question, would several generations of peace and prosperity weaken society's taste for war, appears answerable in the negative. Indeed, in our own time, Several generations of peace and prosperity appear to have bred a bipartisan ignorance of American history, achievements, and principles that has made war not only possible, but more likely. And now I'd like to introduce three very distinguished speakers. And we will go from uh, my immediate left, with, starting with uh, uh, Professor David C. Hendrickson, who holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins and is the Robert J. Fox Distinguished Professor at Colorado College. He's the author of six books, most recently an extraordinarily good book called P Peace Pact, The Lost World of the American Founding. Next to Dr. Hendrickson, Thomas Donnelly, a resident fellow in defense and security studies at, Amer at the American Enterprise Institute. He is the co-author of four books, including The Military We Need, The Defense Requirements of the Bush Doctrine, and a frequent, I think, contributor to the Weekly Standard. <laughs> and Dr. Donnelly's far side is uh, uh, Dr. Ivan Eland. Dr. Eland is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute and a director of the Institute Center for Peace and Liberty, formerly at the Cato Institute, I believe. He's assistant editor of the Independent Institute's Independent Review and author of a book about Amer America's imperial pretensions, the empire, has no, the empire Has No Clothes, which is available in the, in the lobby. We decided that we would uh, have Dr. Elin speak first, to be followed by Dr. Gon Donnelly, and uh, the morning will be completed by uh, Dr. Hendrickson. So thank you all for coming, and I think you'll find these three gentlemen extraordinarily knowledgeable and provocative. Well, I'd like to thank the uh, center and the university for inviting me here to speak. It's been a very uh, 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 fruitful conference so far. And uh, I wish Michael hadn't given that introduction about ignorance of history, because uh, at this conference, I, with a bunch of historians, uh, and I'm not a historian, I feel a little bit ignorant uh, and maybe, maybe part of that problem. Uh, so I'm hoping that people will give me a break. Um, if you remember the movie Animal House, um, there was a scene where the, the uh, fraternity has been placed by Dr. Wormer, the university president, on double secret probation. And uh, John Belushi uh, is trying to rev up the 
fraternity and saying, you know, we can't let this defeat us, et cetera. You know, when the going get tough, the tough get going. And he said, and, you know, and when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor, did, the, did we give up? No. And one of the, one of the uh, <laughs> fraternity members nudges the president of the fraternity goes, hey, wait a minute, the Germans didn't bomb, bomb Pearl Harbor. And, and, and the president replied, uh, shut up, he's on a roll. So I'm hoping that, so I'm hoping that if I get a couple historical facts wrong, uh, you won't condemn me. But I'm going to try to. I do know a little bit of history, and um, I'm going to try to go into a brief sketch of the U.S. Empire, and what I believe is the U.S. Empire. Now, the U.S. doesn't have a formal empire like the British or the Roman Empire, but to me, an empire, uh, as distinguished from what we've been talking about earlier in the conference. Uh, the American Empire, which the westward movement, et cetera, to me that was more aggressive nation building. Uh, now the difference is, I think, uh, in my book, uh, an empire is when you rule foreign peoples, but you don't let them have representation. Uh, now that may be a simplistic definition, but that's my rule of thumb definition. And therefore, our overseas empire, I think, started with the Spanish-American War. Some people. I, I've been criticized. Some people say Hawaii, but and that may have been true at the time, but we've eventually incorporated Hawaii into the country. So I think Spanish-American War probably uh, marks the first uh, overseas imperial venture for the United States. Um, this didn't take, uh, uh, it didn't really take root because of our anti-imperial tradition. Uh, or at least the rhetorical anti-imperial tradition. And therefore, I think after World War II, the American uh, empire became permanent and global. Now, some would say, well, we were fighting the Soviet Union, et cetera. And I think that's true, but I don't think that explains everything. And um, I think many of the Cold War uh, leaders at the time, Atchison and others, admitted that they exaggerated the Soviet threat because they, had, they were using the Soviet threat to remake the world. And uh, the best demonstration, I think, is that is a very simple one, and that is that uh, the Soviet Union went away, but the American uh, empire didn't. Uh, the, Amer the empire expanded. We've expanded NATO twice now in territory and in mission. We've strengthened our East Asian alliances. We've put military bases in Central America under the guise of uh, uh, fighting terror, uh, uh, et cetera. And uh, I, I think th uh, there was some legitimacy in the, in the Central American bases, but there, I assure you they're probably going to be permanent, at least most of them, unless uh, the countries uh, uh, rebel and say no. Um, so I think uh, this, this uh, empire expanded, uh, and so we're doing more now than we did in the Cold War in, in interventions, simply because we can. There's nobody to stop us. And I think we saw Bill Clinton, who is the king of foreign interventions as far as number, um, just a few of them are Bosnia, Kosovo, Somalia, and Haiti. Um, and uh, of course, President Bush, the second President Bush has carried on that tradition with Iraq, uh, the Iraq in intervention, which may be the most uh, spectacular of them all, but uh, certainly m my view is that this policy is really uh, goes across administrations. Uh, and. Um, uh, David Hendrickson was making some comments about the rhetorical differences between uh, Bush's uh, uh, foreign policy and his predecessors, but I would I'd like to stress the, the similarities. Um, you know, Bush has rejected containment and deterrence uh, in, in rhetorical manner, but yet he's sort of containing North Korea. Uh, in, in contrast, uh, Clinton was ready to fight a preventative war if the Koreans, North Koreans didn't get rid of their nuclear weapons. So uh, if anything, the Bush uh, policy has probably been more moderate on North Korea. Uh, now, uh, to say that he, we're promoting democracy with force, well, uh, Clinton also promoted democracy with force by, uh, uh, in Haiti, threatening to invade the country if uh, Cedrus, the dictator, didn't uh, abdicate and uh, uh, reinstate Aristide, who was the elected president. Uh, and, and I suppose you could even say Bush's father uh, uh, launched a preventative war against Panama, uh, long forgotten in 1989. Uh, and I'm not sure what he was preventing the threat, but uh, he or if, what he, I'm not sure exactly what they were doing with that. I guess Noriega, Noriega became an embarrassment, and it was part of the Monroe Doctrine, et cetera. It was never very clear to me why they did that. But these wars have happened before. And oftentimes, what we have is that the, the Democrats will criticize Bush 
uh, for doing this type of thing, but excuse Clinton and vice versa. So we get uh, a situation, uh, if you remember, the conservatives were very much against nation building and that sort of thing uh, before the, uh, during the Bosnia and Kosovo actions, but uh, of course, uh, uh, they're much more, or they have been much more supportive of the president's uh, current um, uh, foray into Iraq. Now, uh, I think the Bush Cold War, uh, they use a threat of 9-11 to remake the world. The Bush administration did just as the, as the leaders used the Soviet threat, uh, which, was, which is a, was a legitimate threat, but of course they used that to do other things. Um, and this is inescapable that policymakers uh, use these things uh, for their own benefits. Now, if you doubt that the Bush administration did, on 9-11, the day of the attacks, uh, Rumsfeld went into the National Military Command Center and his aides were taking notes. And he said, uh, and this is a bit disjointed because these are notes, but he said, good hit S at time, not only you I'll sweep it off things and and not. Now, uh, that last little and to not hate that they know that has the Osama bin Laden, and yet they're going to uh, do it anyway. So I saw this uh, invasion, uh, which had no 11 attacks, or at least there's been no, uh, significant evidence to that effect. Uh, so we didn't election sort of thing. So as I mentioned, uh, this was an excuse. And one policymaker in the Far East, uh, the admiral who's the Pacific commander, sort of admitted we went to the Philippines uh, after this Qaeda affiliate because we wanted to go back into the Philippines, not because we really cared about uh, this little group that was linked to Al-Qaeda in the Philippines. We also went to Georgia, Yemen, so the problem that we have with this is that I, I buy a bit of economics. I buy heavily into the of economics with state. Uh, no, no matter what the policy is, you have the people who want it are very organized. They're very, uh, they lay heavily policy. And the people who pay for it are all the taxpayers who don't know much about the policy, whatever it is, whether it's a welfare program or this new tank. Uh, the problem is, like this stuff, who really can uh, want the program, probably heavily, they put a lot of, uh, of course, the, people, the citizens who are paying for it don't pay for that individual program. So that's why we have programs. It's a case of uh, the foreign aid men. It's a very good example of that. The um, question comes, uh, this us versus them. Us, in my view, uh, different uh, terrorist groups. It's th Thirty. What's that? Most of those groups don't act states. Terrorism or axis of to Al Qaeda. Uh, they're the ones that attacked us. Now, this is where it, where it probably should have stopped. In this public choice, uh, kind of use it frequently. Uh, what we uh, the U.S. government necessarily, in my view, interest in considering. Uh, it's whoever's the political, politically the strongest uh, people. And there's a lot of vested interest in this foreign policy. I think if the United States government was a citizen, they would have had a much different policy after 9-11. They would have gone after all. They would have done it in the shadows, more U.S. Uh, back in special forces, intelligence, law enforcement, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, you would have also uh, removed a lot of this. Now, throughout history, it's blowback. The problem now that we have is that the communication, the communication and the weapons um, much uh, potent, and therefore we can get uh, uh, on our soil. I make no mistake about it, but um, uh, Al-Qaeda is not as for our freedoms. I mean, the data don't indicate that. I don't think uh, 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 the poll in the Arab world indicate that. Uh, all the polls in the Arab and Islamic world indicate that the Arab countries, the Islamic countries, like us for our, our political and culture. When you get to the foreign policy, the plummet on any poll that they take. And um, if you watch the United States, his grievance about foreign policy, uh, pre Persian Gulf military presence, or corrupt air support for Israel. Uh, the reason, the, if we want uh, an ambit, we want security now, uh, in contrast with one another, um, war, uh, things are uh, still getting involved in every. Well, this gets things a lot of blood the United States and 9 11. One, why these are like this, believe they're like this, as I mentioned. Uh, there are certain vested interests, uh, military, um, et cetera, which point to uh, But if we now have a conflict between the empire, one could argue that the U.S. empire did bring a security good empire. Whether we're still doing so, it is an uh, interesting question. Um, my view, uh, make an argument to some extent, I was as far as U.S. policy did, but the advantage are gone now with the Soviet enemy gone. And, I, and to me, the, the disadvantage is 
and blowback outweigh um, the advantages of doing it now that the Cold War is over. Like a great idea uh, during the 80s for Carter, who started the policy, and then Ronald Reagan, who took it a, a notch or two of, of Mujahideen guerrillas uh, invasions in Afghanistan. And this was supposed to give the words of uh, Carter's national security advisor. Well, it seemed like a wonderful idea at the time. That, uh, and Afghanistan was a backwater area in the Cold War. But it ended up creating one of the few strategic threats, excuse me, strategic threat to the U.S. homeland in the history of the country. So are we better off at policy? I, I think this intervention is unintended consequence. And we have a lot of people in Washington that uh, like board, of course. Uh, this chess playing can have uh, dire effects for the center of the country. And I think my own view is that, the, that perhaps we ought to go back to traditional U.S. policy. Um, uh, we've never been convicted staying out of those business. Uh, certainly, uh, perfect in war, the Spanish-American War, but uh, at the time of the founding, uh, there were there was an effort to stay out of Europe's wars. Now, we uh, early in this came up was this idea. Yes, to George Washington also in some of his uh, um, um, speeches said that the U.S. had a security situation. We were very secure in uh, acts, uh, and it was very hard to get over here. This was a, the center of the world's conflicts uh, was over, were somewhere in Europe. And he believed that we had a difficult advantage. And I think that's still true. We have, of course, modern weapons uh, have made us a little, the distance is a little shorter. But there's one which has made us less. We always hear about the interdependent world, but there's an aspect of the world that's not more interdependent, that's less interdependent. And I think that's uh, cross-border aggression, cross-border dropping for decades. One big reason is nuclear weapons. Uh, countries would uh, try to attack the United States simply because of address, and we have the most potent nuclear arsenal on the planet, and we also have the most potent uh, conventional forces on the planet. So it's a sort of suicidal for a country to attack us. But a terrorist, of course, is not subjected to, uh, uh, may not be, uh, may not buy into that deterrence because they don't have a home address. They keep on the move. They they may be sheltered by a country. They may not be. They may just be roaming around. But but the real uh, issue is uh, if we don't need to it's because we're relatively secure, then perhaps we can reduce our military interventions overseas and reduce the motivation of terrorism terrorists to attack us. Terrorists do attack us anyway. Of course, I think we should have a swift response. But I don't think it should be uh, a showy. Uh, um, invasion of a, of a country, uh, and also we want to make sure that we're attacking the people that attacked us and not uh, some other third party. I mean, attacking Iraq to me after 9-11 was kind of like saying, well, if uh, the Japanese just bombed Pearl Harbor and the Nazis just declared war on us, let's go to war with Romania. I mean, it didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me. And so I think you've got to get the right enemy. Uh, and you got to fight them in the right manner, uh, and without a lot of um, uh, excessive, uh, and uh, without a lot of uh, excessive, uh, uh, an excessive use of force. And you certainly don't want to stay around in a country and uh, create, uh, particularly in an Islamic country, and cr create more uh, terrorists uh, by the day. And I think a uh, number of incidents of terrorism has gone up in the last couple of years, even according to the State Department's own measures uh, worldwide. And also, uh, uh, Richard Clark, who is the uh, counterterrorism chief for uh, the Clinton and the Bush administrations, uh, has mentioned that the ter number of terrorist attacks has increased in the three years since 9-11 from the three years prior to 9-11. So I think, uh, although the data is still sketchy, uh, we have some indication that perhaps this type of policy, and I'm not simply uh, blaming the Bush administration because the Clinton administration, as, as Michael just pointed out, uh, waged an offensive war in Kosovo. And uh, you say, well, he wasn't as uni Clinton wasn't as unilateralist. Well, he, he couldn't get a UN resolution, so he did it with NATO. And of course, the United States runs NATO. And of course, as Michael points out, the situation probably worse because Clinton didn't get approval from Congress for that war. Um, Bush, of course, did not get a declaration, as Michael also pointed out, um, 
for the war in Iraq, but he did get a congressional uh, resolution. Clinton got no resolution, uh, no anything in the Kosovo uh, conflict. So we see this policy goes across uh, administrations, and the real question is, is this policy um, you know, providing security? We certainly have an empire of alliances, bases, uh, and uh, foreign aid, and also uh, military interventions. Uh, and most Americans don't really know how much we've intervened overseas. Uh, if you take out a list in the post-Cold War or in the post-World War II era, you might as well list the countries that we haven't intervened in rather than the countries that we have. It's quite a long list, and uh, I, I'm, I think that many Americans are unfamiliar uh, with that. And so I think that uh, many of these. Uh, we have two strands, to go back to a little bit of history, two strands in American foreign policy, but they kind of end up at the same place. Uh, we've got the um, Republican interventionists, which started with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and they want to remake the world in the U.S. image, but they have this national greatness, national uh, power underlying that. Uh, then you have the Democratic version, which Clinton uh, exemplified, and that was uh, the Wilsonian uh, do-gooderism, I don't know, that's, that's not a word, but uh, in general, do-good international law and, and, and this sort of thing. But you come out the same, at the same place. Now, most of these interventions have been sold, uh, at least during the Clinton administration, uh, as humanitarian interventions. And most of those had really nothing to do with humanitarian interventions. Bosnia, Kosovo, and Haiti are examples that I would put out. And Haiti is a very interesting case because we were going down there, there we were removing this dictator, and we were putting in this, uh, reinstating this democratic uh, leader. But the real problem and the, what really motivated this is, it goes back to the domestic factors that we were talking about with foreign aid just a moment ago, and that is that the Florida congressional delegation put heavy pressure on Clinton uh, to do something about all these Haitian refugees that were washing up on Florida's shores. Well, f that's a very potent issue for a president because uh, we all know that Florida is very um, a key electoral state, many electoral votes. So you see these uh, ulterior motives uh, um, cropping up. And we always have justifications uh, for war, uh, humanitarian in the case of Clinton. Uh, in the case of Bush, we have the democ democratizing Iraq. Well. I'm not very convinced. <coughs> we, all, we all treat this uh, democratization rhetoric as if it's really true. But if you, we look at our actions on the ground, which is you can't, you know, talk is cheap in my book, and the actions on the ground in Iraq didn't really indicate too much of a desire for democracy. The original uh, Pentagon plan was to go in, slice off the top of the bureaucracy, put in these uh, exiles, and get out within 60 days. Well, of course, that didn't. That didn't work out very well, uh, but that, th there really wasn't much of a democratizing influence. Even after Bremer that got there, he had a seven-point plan, uh, which was not exactly the road to democracy. Then they mo had to modify it to do caucuses, these caucus systems. And the Ayatollah Sistani, who, of course, you're for democracy if you have the majority, right? And the Ayatollah Sistani controls about 60% of the votes. Uh, and, uh, uh, in, in Iraq, and so he said, no, I want to vote. He told me that you're bringing democracy to Iraq, I want to vote. So the only reason that we had the vote was because of Sistani. So, and then, of course, we also, the United States also closed down a press, uh, uh, a, 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 a newspaper, uh, which, do, which doesn't seem to be very de uh, democratic, and of course, this caused the Shiite riots, or more than riots, a rebellion in the South. Uh, of course, we also were going to have the, the U.S. military was trying to organize a local election until they found out that the wrong person was going to win, and they canceled the election. So, you know, uh, the United States uh, historically really hasn't uh, promoted democracy. In fact, we've overthrown d democratic leaders: Guatemala, Chile, Iran. Uh, it was just mentioned uh, Johnson in uh, uh, 1965 in. in uh, uh, Dominican Republic wasn't exactly a democratic thing. So w if we, we have a choice between a democratic government and a friendly government. The United States historically has usually uh, chosen the friendly government. So I think a lot of this rhetoric uh, we have to get rid of both for, from the Democrats and from the Republicans. And I would say that it's time to uh, 
I'm an advocate, of course, of a more restrained military policy and uh, using military force only as a last resort. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I, I think it is my lonely task on this panel to uh, try to de defend uh, the Bush Doctrine, and I'm sure we'll get into talking about the war in Iraq and all that kind of stuff, which I've been certainly introduced. Uh, but I'd, I'd rather offer an explanation before I offer any uh, even very hedged defense. Um, it, it's been quite striking to me uh, the emotion that uh, – uh, uh, the, the promulgation of the Bush Doctrine has, has uh, produced, and of also, of course, the President himself tends to make people see uh, red, otherwise uh, fairly sensible people, and when they see red, they're not just seeing states go up in uh, his uh, electoral column uh, on Election Day. Uh, so you get this very you know, curious thing that uh, uh, that a significant majority, first actual majority of Americans since 1988, reelected a guy who's supposed to be militaristic, expansionist, and uh, unilateralist, and in fact imperialistic. So it, it is a the, the dichotomy between elite opinion and American broader opinion uh, uh, is where I would like to begin, and it gives me a chance to reprise some of my favorite uh, anti-Bush quotes. My, my favorite being immediately after the election, the Daily Mirror headline uh, asking the question why 59,054,087 Ameri uh, Americans were so dumb. Um, and that actually, I think, captures uh, the feelings of a lot of people, including a lot of Americans, and in particular, uh, a lot of uh, longstanding foreign, foreign policy mandarins. Uh, uh, I haven't mentioned that and I think I would agree with his analysis that the Clinton administration uh, did lay some of the found work for what this administration, uh, founding for, for what this administration has done, but that didn't prevent uh, uh, Evo Dalder and James Lindsay, who were on the Clinton NSC, from describing the Bush Doctrine and the war in Iraq as a, as a Bush revolution. And in fact, this revealed that America was unbound. Uh, and of course, that would not only be a danger to the world, but a danger to us. Um, and in, uh, that, that view is, I think, broadly shared by more conventional conservatives uh, who agree that the Bush Doctrine is, if nothing else, an all-out assault on the status quo. And members of the Bush, uh, Bush administration have been signaled among, among those expressing this viewpoint, uh, former Secretary of State James Baker, his successor Larry Eagleburger, uh, but I think uh, most notably uh, 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 Brent Scowcroft, uh, National Security Advisor during the first Bush administration, who has uh, gone on record several times uh, as uh, particularly opposing uh, the Iraq War, he did sort of, as an aside, acknowledge that the world would be a better place without Saddam Hussein uh, in charge of much of anything. Uh, but of course, any campaign in Iraq, he said, whatever the strategy, whatever the cost and risk, is certain to divert us from, for some indefinite period from our war on terrorism. And I think this was actually uh, something like the argument that Michael was making in his opening remarks, and I don't want to uh, put words in his mouth, uh, but this has been, uh, uh, again, a, a central critique uh, of the uh, Bush doctrine, as though somehow, uh, as Michael said, uh, one of the most important places and, and one of the most important capitals in all of Arabia, if not in all of Islam, uh, was somehow uh, uh, irrelevant to trying to foment political change uh, in that part of the world. And this is hardly the worst of it. More radical commentators uh, believe that uh, this was not only going to be a danger abroad, but a danger to our liberties at home. Uh, unfortunately, Osama bin Laden has resurrected Chalmers Johnson as a supposedly serious person. Uh, uh, his book, uh, The Sorrows of Empire, sort of picked up uh, the strains of his economic critiques of the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and he said, from the moment we took on a role that included the permanent military domination of the world, we were on our own, feared, hated, corrupt, 
maintaining order through state terrorism and bribery, and given to megalomaniacal, megalomaniac uh, uh, rhetoric and sophistries that virtually invited the rest of the world to unite against us. Um, and, and my friend Andy Vasevich, kind of on the other side of the spectrum, but meeting maybe on the dark side of the moon, uh, believes that uh, militarism has insinuated itself into the very fabric of American life. Um, and that in, in this uh, position we find ourselves, that we've fallen away from the original American experiment uh, that, uh, that the founders envisioned. And of course, the loudest uh, protest uh, came from then Governor Howard Dean, uh, who uh, uh, gave us his famous uh, primal scream candidacy. And uh, uh, I think it is actually wrong to underestimate or to simply to lampoon uh, uh, Howard Dean and, and the sort of move on dot wing of the Democratic Party because clearly it had an effect uh, on the Kerry campaign and it continues to have a, a very important effect on the Democratic Party. Um, uh, and we'll see how this uh, uh, turns out. But it did have the effect of making uh, a Massachusetts liberal sound like a uh, Scowcroftian or Kissingerian a realist, uh, you know, uh, w wherein liberals become reactionaries. Um, and uh, uh, and that's, that sort of gives you some idea of um, how we've gone through the looking glass, at least uh, uh, relative to uh, the, the immediately uh, past the uh, politics of, of the late Cold War. And of course, President Bush's reelection uh, has done nothing to, to quiet this course of criticism. Uh, Scowcroft has been back several times. He, he feared prior to the Iraq elections that this was going to uh, uh, create a civil war that, rather than prevent it. Uh, the elections weren't going to turn out to be even a small uh, promising turning point, but actually we're going to head the seeds for uh, deepening the conflict within it and uh, uh, to begin where I began with yet another former Clinton NSC staffer, Nancy Soderberg, who put out a post-election book entitled The Superpower Myth. Um, uh, Nancy thinks that uh, um, that history's sole superpower uh, needed to shed its essentially unilateral hegemonic approach to international politics. So how did, how did we go so wrong? Uh, if this Bush doctrine was such a bad idea, how did the president end up convincing a majority of his fellow citizens uh, that it was actually a, a prudent and correct thing to do? And I guess my answer would be that the president is tapping into some rather deep roots uh, in American political culture, but uh, if I were a better social scientist, I would describe as a strategic culture. Um, and while there are a lot of there's a lot of rather impenetrable debate about what strategic culture is, and there's maybe some logical flaws in the idea. I, I think it's a useful tool for, for trying to understand why it is that the Bush Doctrine um, has the resonance uh, that it does. And I think this is going to be important going forward and asking the question or answering the question, will the Bush Doctrine survive George Bush's presidency? Um, but the basic idea is that uh, all things being equal, uh, uh, in, in international politics, uh, different actors, different states uh, are motivated by different, uh, uh, different values and different appraisals of what their national interests are. People or countries in roughly the same situation, uh, strategically speaking, can act uh, quite differently. Um, and I won't go into a, a long expo exposition of that, but, but it is worth noting that the traditional analysis of American strategic culture is very much along the lines that I think uh, Michael suggested, that we have uh, a, a limited war mentality, as, the, as a fellow by the name of Reginald Stewart uh, wrote in the early or in the late uh, Cold War. Um, and this is sort of an analysis that begins with the uh, politics and policies of the Enlightenment. Um, and the idea is that the, uh, although Americans have had this sort of uh, uh, lamentable and ineradicable set of crusading impulses uh, that uh, uh, create a subtext or a sub-theme in uh, our conduct of strategy and our, uh, and our strategy in international politics, that uh, 
essentially we've acted um, as European states do. Uh, that's, that was very much uh, the model. Um, again, without making a huge historical argument, I think it's really rather difficult to explain American behavior going back actually before the founding uh, uh, through this uh, uh, model entirely. It's hard to describe uh, wars against the Indians as limited wars, uh, although each particular campaign in and of itself might be so described, the overall effect was, was hardly that. Uh, and that's the, the same is true with the partisan campaigns of the American Revolution. Um, uh, and you can go on to describe the Civil War that way, uh, or uh, the war in the Philippines, uh, for example. Um, and any nation who uh, numbers William Tecumseh Sherman and Phil Sheridan amongst its greatest captains uh, it, uh, is a nation uh, for whom the limited war uh, uh, tradition uh, certainly uh, has a balancing uh, or an alternative tradition. And I think this is useful uh, for us to try to evaluate and to place the Bush doctrine or any, any president's doctrine or the actions of any particular administration uh, in a larger uh, framework. Uh, this is particularly true, I think, in the post-Cold War period uh, because obviously without our uh, doppelganger uh, uh, benchmark uh, in the Soviet Union to define ourselves by, uh, you know, so much uh, of what's going to take place, uh, what is taking place, what has taken place over the last 15 years or so uh, has been largely defined by how we uh, see the world, how we would like the world uh, to be. Um, and so there's been a, a renewed interest in the sources of American conduct, to paraphrase uh, uh, George Kennan, um, uh, over the last uh, uh, several decades. Again, I won't really summarize that, but I want to identify a number of what I would call strains. One, I think, is fairly described as conservative realism, uh, and I think maybe uh, Walter McDougall's uh, uh, book, Pr Promised Land, Crusader State, is a very readable, uh, exposition of this uh, uh, basic idea. But what I draw from it uh, uh, is a view that uh, the United States is gradually falling away from its, uh, its founding uh, approach to strategy making. Uh, it's almost fair to describe it as the decay of American strategic uh, culture. Um, uh, alternatively, uh, another sort of popular but, but still I think serious exposition uh, it was put forth by Walter Russell Mead um, uh, several years ago. A and to me, this is uh, uh, more in the um, liberal realist tradition, if you will, to, to sort of um, adapt uh, Ivan's terminology. Uh, but uh, again, in my analysis, uh, his, his telling of the story of making American strategy uh, is even more contradictory. Uh, in, in Mead's telling, there are a variety of traditions that are constantly in struggle with one another. Sometimes one is dominant, sometimes the Wilsonian tradition is dominant, sometimes the Jacksonian, uh, and on and on. Um, so uh, it, it does seem rather like a wheel of fortune that gets uh, spinned every, uh, gets spun uh, every now and then, and a new tradition or one of the old tradition emerges in new clothes. Uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, uh, uh, I, would, I would commend a third book to everybody, which is really a collection of lectures, a rather slim volume, uh, by the historian John Lewis Gaddis, uh, a set of lectures given uh, in New York libraries after September 11th, uh, which is an attempt, uh, and obviously given the limitations of the, the lecture format, uh, that requires uh, further exposition by me. Uh, uh, to, to put the whole story together. But in, in Gaddis's telling, there is a consistent American tradition, which I will try to rapidly identify uh, in the time I have remaining to me before I talk a bit about where I think this tradition might be leading us. I, I see essentially four strains uh, in American strategy making. Uh, and, and the first, for want of a better term, is, is simply that we are driven by our our ideology. Uh, I'm sure the term empire of or for liberty has been uh, uh, bandied about uh, more than once uh, in the opening sessions, the previous sessions of, uh, uh, of this conference. Um, but what I would take from that is that 
our purpose is not simply to wield power for reasons of state, but we are driven in part and in significant measure uh, for the purpose of securing the natural political rights which we believe to be that the Creator has endowed to all mankind uh, and, and sort of which alone in the American imagination legitimates the use of, use of power, the necessary uses of power. Uh, it is not that we are uh, sort of cartoonishly idealistic in the Wilsonian strain, but, but neither are we cartoonishly uh, realistic. Um, we, we attempt to use the practical means of power, but for a very different purpose, other than simply the advance of our nation's power. Um, the second sort of theme that, that occurs to me is that we have a kind of middle kingdom, to, to import a Chinese analog, uh, view of the world, a sort of 360 degree strategic horizon, if you will. They've always been extended in many directions, and so far as, or, or from uh, uh, wishing to avoid the conflicts of others abroad. You know, it, to me, no understanding of the American Revolution is uh, possible without understanding the very clever way in which uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin and others uh, tried very hard to make our revolutionary struggle, our struggle for independence, uh, uh, the, a war of others and a war of European empires as well as uh, a war that, that, that we were in, uh, involved in. So we've never really been isolationist. Uh, um, and, and We've always sort of felt ourselves exposed to threats uh, around the perimeter. Uh, curiously enough, for such a eventually continental s scale nation, we've always sort of had this idea that we don't have that much strategic depth. The third theme is, and I think an irrefutable one, is that we have a habit of expansionism. It's really difficult to explain how 13 or even fewer uh, rather argumentative and disparate uh, colonies at the western perimeter of the, the British Empire uh, ended up with security perimeters that now extend from Afghanistan to uh, Taiwan, uh, going westward rather than eastward. Um, so, you know, uh, to me, uh, the question of whether, of just how our, our empire is ruled is, is certainly secondary to the fact that, that it exists. Uh, and certainly, for the founders, empire was not a pejorative term. Uh, and finally, uh, in, in terms of the way we fight, we, I think we have had a long predilection for preemption, prevention, and for what we popularly call regime change today. That, that is sort of politically decisive victories. Uh, the, the current notion of the failed state and the danger that failed states pose to us, uh, to me, really has a, has a deep history in, or deep roots in American strategic thinking. Uh, John Quincy Adams would have called them derelict states, and actually I prefer that term. Uh, the idea that we should act to prevent weak, corrupt, illegitimate governments uh, from making mischief uh, is kind of central to the way we think about the exercise of power. And also, replacing failed states with ones constructed, uh, at least uh, loosely, on an American model, or at least in a way that reflects American uh, political principles, tends to be when we regard a war as, as successfully concluded. So with that background, I'd real quickly like to, to, to improvise uh, 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 about where we stand today and what the prospects for uh, uh, are for the Bush Doctrine for, for the future. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll, again, try to defer Iraq to the second part of this. I, I think there's a strong American impulse in retaining uh, the, the broad liberal stability and peace that we've enjoyed in the expansion of uh, uh, democratic forms of, go of government uh, that have been noted since the end of the Cold War. Um, um, again, uh, I haven't talked a lot about the Clinton administration. Um, and I would even go back to the first Bush administration for all the, the uh, uh, sort of Metternich envy that the principles of the first uh, Bush administration had, they did at the same time uh, promulgate a piece of defense planning guidance in 1992, uh, which uh, ought to be regarded as one of the uh, uh, root sources of the Bush doctrine that we uh, uh, enjoy or 
suffer under uh, today. Um, the actions of the Clinton administration, I think, are inex inexplicable, simply uh, in realist terms. It's wrong to regard the interventions in Somalia or Kosovo or Bosnia uh, or Haiti as, as simply humanitarian <laughs> interventions. But by the same token, uh, you know, again, these, are, these would have been uh, uh, interventions that uh, I, I think any 19th century, that any 19th century realist would have uh, uh, quailed at. Uh, so they, they do strike me as somehow uh, uniquely American. Since September 11th, I think, you know, um, it's, it's worth understanding Iraq and Afghanistan within the larger context of American policy toward the Middle East going back 25 or 30 years. And uh, we've certainly given uh, the policy of containment a pretty good run for its money. Uh, we've tolerated uh, a lot of instability, a lot of wars, and certainly a lot of uh, corrupt and despotic and tyrannical governments in the region, as other presenters have uh, noted, uh, without too much flutter um, over that uh, period of time. Uh, I think my interpretation, or my hopeful interpretation, of what the administration uh, is basing its policy on is a recognition that, that that containment policy is no longer sustainable, that there is an internal movement uh, in the Middle East, represented most strikingly by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, uh, and, and rooted in dissatisfaction in the political conditions uh, that exist there, and that essentially this is uh, a revolutionary movement that we cannot be uh, agnostic about. Uh, and, and certainly I would say September 11th uh, uh, suggests that, that they're not agnostic about our role in supporting a variety, the the panoply of uh, illegitimate governments in the region. So we're kind of in a race to define the future uh, of the Middle East and going back to the status quo or prolonging indefinitely uh, the rule of the, the Saudi royal family or the Mubarak uh, family in Egypt or you name it. Uh, um, the, the rule of the Pakistani army by, uh, uh, of Pakistan. Uh, is bound to fail in the long term. Now you've got to have generations long, probably even century long horizons uh, in describing this, this commitment and this struggle. Um, uh, and, and in that regard, I would say that the, the broader war has been reasonably well begun in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, if we were sitting here three years ago and we were Las Vegas bookmakers, and uh, we said, you know, which of these two adventures is likely to be more successful and which less successful? Well, the conventional wisdom would have been that Afghanistan, the graveyard of empires, was doomed to failure and that Iraq, which naturally had a huge middle class and, you know, was the most enlightened and politically progressive country in the Middle East, uh, would be an easy and, and smashing success. Um, Iraq has turned out not to be that but neither it is the, the uh, uh, Vietnam-like disaster that, that many would, uh, would portray it as. Uh, conversely, things in Afghanistan, although we've got a huge long way to go there, are, uh, based on my uh, observations and my visits there, uh, actually remarkably uh, in good shape. That may simply be because Afghans, after 30 years, are tired of slaughtering one another. But for whatever reason, um, a relatively small American force uh, is making a huge difference there. And when President Karzai comes to this country begging for a strategic partnership with the United States, that, that uh, makes my ears perk up. Uh, I want to conclude uh, with, with a real brief discussion because the other great international political question or security question of the 21st century is whether China. Everybody, uh, I think, accepts that China's economic rise is bound to have political consequences. The question is what kind of consequences uh, are those going to be? And without going through uh, my views in detail, um, there are two things that are uh, worth noting and uh, certainly from an American perspective important to keep in mind. Uh, the first is that a strategic partnership with China as it is currently uh, internally um, uh, constructed 
seems rather unlikely and, and uh, more likely to lead to uh, unhappiness and, and violence. Um, this was the policy of the Clinton administration and at times has been the policy of the Bush administration, which seems to feel very strongly both ways about China. Uh, but uh, the, the trick is going to be how to fashion a policy that uh, uh, allows for the simple fact of economic engagement with China, but at the same time uh, uh, hedges against uh, geopolitical competition, which I think we can already see um, uh, on the horizon. It's going to be very far difficult, more difficult uh, strategic dance than, than containing the Soviet Union was. Soviet Union didn't really make anything other than weapons that anybody cared about. Uh, but I think the, the real nightmare scenario is the confluence of uh, uh, aggressive Chinese policy and the continued instability in the Middle East, uh, which again, I already see some indicators of in places like, uh, like Sudan. All that said, uh, I, I would conclude with a, on a relatively hopeful note uh, to say that um, uh, betting against the exercise of American power over the last 250 years has been generally a losing proposition. If we've lost uh, some past allies, I think we're in the process of f fashioning or uh, hooking up with some new ones, uh, most notably India. Uh, and, and Japan, so far unlike Germany, uh, has not entirely lost uh, uh, the belief that the use of military force is a legitimate ele element in statecraft. And you might even say that on balance we've uh, uh, exchanged a, a set of allies who have turned out to be rather, rather uh, uh, on the decline for, for some allies that, that will be more useful to us. So um, I think the Bush Doctrine or something like it, perhaps with somebody else's name on it, call it the Hillary Doctrine, uh, might be around uh, for generations to come simply because it's deeply rooted in the American tradition. So thanks. Well, here I am again. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, don't want to intrude too much on your patience, so I will try to be uh, brief, and I don't want to uh, repeat myself. I thought that what I would do was uh, talk a bit about the uh, Bush Doctrine and the American position in the world today in relationship to a bodily metaphor and to think about the, uh, the mind, the heart, the legs, uh, the arms, and the breath, each of those standing for a particular problem, the mind, of course, uh, of what it is that the Bush administration hopes to accomplish in the world and how to characterize their ambitions, but the arms, uh, then the limits, uses of military power, the heart, uh, the problem of American legitimacy and it's uh, the acceptance of American power elsewhere in the world, uh, the legs uh, as a metaphor for the sustainability of this enterprise. Uh, will our legs give out uh, on us? And then the breath, or what the Chinese call uh, qi, the sort of life force, uh, which is uh, I use as a sort of metaphor for the influence of political culture on American foreign policy. Uh, what is it about the American people, about the way we are, that makes us uh, think about the world in a certain way? And does that have implications for our, for our conduct of a foreign policy. Now, in, in characterizing the uh, uh, ambitions of the United States and t today, it does seem to me that empire is a, uh, is a useful term, but I would go further and say that uh, we aim at something which would be recognizable by previous writers as, as universal empire. Now, that's a term that is, is no longer in, in, in use today among writers, but it was, it, was a, it was a term of art, as it were, among uh, a great many writers in the history of the European state system and among the publicists of the law of nations, uh, people that are America's founding fathers paid a great deal of attention to, and they, they meant it to describe a situation 
in which one power could give the law to the others. So we might say that empire is ruling other, over other peoples without their consent, whereas universal empire is ruling over the state system or the society of states without its consent. And it does seem to me that that um, is a fair depiction of American policy today. We all know that with the end of the Cold War, the United States inherited, as it were, a condition of unipolarity. Uh, we'd built up this great mili military machine in the course of the Cold War, and when the Soviet Union begged off that competition, we found ourselves in a position of real military primacy, and that was really unprecedented in the history of the world. From a, a standpoint of, of classical economic theory, that raised dangers. From the standpoint of all of the great precepts of Whig constitutionalism, which so deeply informed America's founding, it posed great dangers because power is one of these things that um, has to be subject to restraint in some fashion. Uh, and so the, the conjunction of America's overwhelming power, uh, when that was combined with uh, the strategic innovations of the Bush administration, I think that that suggested this classic uh, uh, danger of a sort of universal empire. Obviously, that doesn't mean that the United States intends to uh, invade and occupy all the countries of the world and seeks to rule them directly. But the, uh, it does mean that, that the United States, as the Bush administration has quite candidly said, would no longer be subject to the traditional rules governing the use of force. And the two great innovations of the administration were to insist upon the right of the United States to use force preemptively that is not in in response to a direct attack, but offensively to anticipate a future danger. And also more recently, to justify the Iraq War in relation to the uh, presumed right to extend democratic institutions via military force. <clears throat> now all the, the classic writers regarded this kind of condition of u universal power as dangerous not only to others, but also to the possessors of it. Um, and they wrote that ambition would blindly labor for the destruction of the conqueror. There was something in the character of overweening power that brought about complications for its possessors. This Montesquieu said that Louis XIV accused a thousand times of having formed and pursued the project of universal empire. Uh, he doubted that he had done so, but had he been successful in pursuit of that, nothing would have been more fatal to Europe, to his first subjects, to himself, and to his family. Uh, Hume, uh, a man with great influence on the thinking of uh, America's founders, wrote, enormous monarchies are probably destructive to human nature in their progress, in their continuance, and even in their downfall, which can never be very distant from their establishment. Hume traced out, as had Montesquieu, a natural process by which aggrandizement turned on itself. Thus human nature checks itself in its airy elevation. Thus ambition blindly labors for the destruction of the conqueror. Uh, Rousseau, another writer, reached a conclusion very similar to that of Hume. If the princes who were accused of aiming at universal empire were in reality, reality guilty of any such project, they gave more proof of ambition than of genius. How could any man look such a project in the face without instantly perceiving its absurdity? Well, I think that that's a very good question. And it does seem to me that the, the very magnitude of America's ambitions are dangerous for us. Uh, they, the classic lesson taught by the writers on international relations is that if you uh, try to punch above your true weight, you can get clobbered. Uh, and that the necessary thing to think about in terms of strategy is to find a policy in which you pay for what you want and want only what you're willing to pay for. Uh, that you keep policy within reasonable bounds. That excess is just as dangerous as deficiency. And I think that we need to uh, think about that lesson. Now let's 
pursue the various elements of this bodily analogy, the arms, uh, first off. Uh, the United States does have this extraordinary military power, but I think we've learned in the last few years that there are very serious limits to it. Um, we've been engaged in a debate over the last couple of years over what went wrong in Iraq. And, uh, you know, the democratic critique of that is well known. What went wrong in Iraq was that the Bush administration invaded with few two forces. They didn't have a plan. Um, you know, they were incompetent in various ways. And I think that that's actually a very misleading critique, you know, that we would have done it better, say the Democrats. Well, it seems to me that the real problems that we faced in Iraq really flowed from the enterprise itself. Uh, we broke this state, and by breaking the state, uh, we, we in effect destroyed Iraq's immune system and made it vulnerable to what we might call the Arab disease. What's that? Well, that's the existence of 20 or 30 different groups, each of which have a, a line to the Almighty and who will fight fanatically for their uh, objectives, such that it's impossible to find anyone now to negotiate with among the insurgents, even if we wish to do that. Uh, even if we were to bring one of those parties into the constitutional bargaining, others would remain outside of it. And our very means of making war against the insurgency itself has the, the uh, result of in increasing the number of recruits to it. So it seems to me that what that, the lesson of this campaign it's not that there was some really clever way, had these guys not been incompetent, by which we could have brought about the re rehabilitation of the state, but rather that there are certain intrinsic limits to military power, and that the Bush administration tasked our military with, a for, with, a, with a, an objective that they just really couldn't bring about given the um, uh, given those inherent limits that were uh, that military power is subjected to, that's related to the question of legitimacy or the question of the heart. Uh, you know, it's an old lesson in 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 politics, one that's affirmed by Thucydides, by Grotius, by many ancient writers, that the justice of one's cause uh, is related to uh, one's ability to succeed in it. Uh, uh, we, Thucydides relates the story of the Spartans who fought with much greater efficacy uh, in the latter half of the Peloponnesian War when, because they were convinced that their backs were to the wall. And th the logic of it is basically very simple. <clears throat> in war, if you go to war out of true necessity with no alternative, then your resolution is not going to falter when you confront difficulties. But if you go to war out of choice, not out of necessity, uh, then setbacks inevitably seem something, a, a matter for a regret. And they do weaken resolution, as we found, since support for the Iraq war has declined rather precipitously, and, and, and now is at a, at a very, at, is at a very low state. Undoubtedly, having invaded Iraq, we have an obligation to not simply abandon the territory. And it does seem to me that there, we have a duty to the Iraqi people, having done this, to try to make the best of the situation. Unfortunately, we seem not to have a strategy to do that, such that staying the course doesn't uh, promise a very satisfactory result for the United States, but rather a perpetuation of the insurgency or simply the installation of an Islamic regime very closely tied to the Iranians. And uh, it's, uh, that's not a grand thing to have gone to war for or a grand result. What is the cause of the loss of American legitimacy? And it seems to me undoubtedly that's taken place if one reads the uh, public opinion polls elsewhere in the world. Uh, the support for the United States has declined precipitously all across the world. What's that rooted in? Well, it, it seems to me it's rooted in the abandonment of law and that respect for law is a vital component 
of legitimate behavior. Uh, it's often said that law is you know, unrealistic and utopian, and that's a somewhat misleading critique. Obviously, the law, international law, is not self-enforcing. Uh, it's a peculiar system of law because its enforcement is decentralized and rests upon the willingness of, you, of, of, of states to use their power in defense of law. Uh, but if, if power is used outside of the law or in contempt of law, uh, especially by the world's most powerful state, uh, this inevitably casts you know, grave doubts upon the legitimacy of American conduct. So if we're to seek to regain legitimacy and seek to regain the confidence of the world, it seems to me that we have to subscribe again to the importance of international law. And that's simply a way of regulating power. That's a, it's a way of ensuring that, that power is not unbounded, that it's not used simply for the discretion of one man or one country, but on behalf of a larger system of international order. Uh, and I think that's what the world wants. Now, the Bush administration has proposed a different solution to that. And they've sought to recapture legitimacy by embracing uh, a, a kind of crusade for democracy. <clears throat> and they've invoked America's founding fathers on behalf of that enterprise. I think that's a very misleading association. When Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence uh, that all men are created equal and are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he also believed that every nation had a right to determine its own form of government. And that was a consensus in the 18th century in the United States, just as it was a consensus uh, throughout the 19th century. Even Woodrow Wilson believed that. You know, Woodrow Wilson, when he brought the, the United States into the First World War, pledged uh, American power to make the world safe for democracy, but he did not mean by that that the United States had a right to invade other countries for the purpose of making them democratic. In Mexico, which is the classic instance where he intervened, he saw that really as a case of counter-intervention because the European powers had supported the coup against Francisco Madero that had brought Huerta to power. And Wilson was intent on bringing Huerta down. But as I say in his own mind, he conceived of that as a kind of restoration of the autonomy of self-determination of the Mexican people. And uh, he stood for election in 1916 on the ground that it was the Mexicans themselves that had the right to determine their future and that American intervention could not bring that about. So it, it, it's kind of remarkable because we associate Wilson with this enterprise and uh, think of those who support uh, the democratist enterprise today as neo-Wilsonians. But I think if one goes back and looks very carefully at, at what Wilson said and what he did, that that association is very much misplaced. Wilson was in favor, as I'm in favor, of supporting a, the community of democracies. And it's perfectly legitimate for the United States to give aid to those peoples who are trying to make democracy a success. We're doing that in Eastern Europe. Uh, we've done that to a certain degree in Latin America. Uh, there are grounds for uh, U.S. support for democratic movements abroad. But invading another country for the purpose of changing its political form, that goes beyond the pale. That goes beyond accepted understandings of, of what is rightful and lawful uh, that were very deeply believed in by not only America's founding fathers, but many others after them. Uh, legs, is it sustainable? Well, I think that we've got a really serious problem on that score. If you, if you look up or look at the various insolvencies in America's economic accounts, uh, we've got this budget deficit that is uh, still pretty big. We've got a trade deficit that almost inevitably is going to produce a dollar crisis. We've got these yawning health care liabilities. Uh, um, 
we've got a deficit that's going to grow larger given those health care liabilities and problems and pensions. As Tom Donnelly has himself written, we've got a Bush doctrine that's itself very severely underfunded in the sense that if you take seriously what the Bush administration wants to do, they've not provided the sources and the funds to the American military to really support that objective. So if you think about those, all of those yawning deficiencies, it seems to me that there really is a very serious problem in the sustainability of American policy, and that's, that's very important. That's something that uh, part of what Eisenhower called the great equation that has to be a fundamental aspect of American grand strategy. Uh, finally, there's the breadth, our cultural style, you know, the, the way we are and the way we think about the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny about that. I, I think Americans are, in many ways, very perceptive, um, uh, at least in certain quarters, of what goes on in, in, in foreign lands. But there's a kind of uh, cultural tendency in which we want very badly to see ourselves as fighting in a righteous cause. And in public, our politicians uh, don't uh, talk about our warts and our failures. We may understand those very well as citizens, and no, we don't live in a uh, utopia here in the United States. But our political leaders flatter us. We're the most generous, uh, the kindest, uh, the most of everything. And uh, that's a, um, I think that's a defect. That's not something that is conducive to sober action in the world. We also have a tendency to not really understand the effect of our actions on others. Um, that Jeffersonian doctrine about the natural rights of man gives to other people the same rights that we claim to ourselves. They have a right to security too. Uh, and, and it's in incumbent upon us not to read them out of the human race and to try to understand their security predicaments so as to reach a peaceful solution. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, the case for that Iraq war uh, depended upon Bush's assertion that you can't deter a madman. He's a madman, Hussein. Well, what is that but reading our adversaries out of the human race? you know, considering them as a, uh, you know, merely beast without the capacity to reason. That's one example of that, uh, but I think it's a very telling example. And our adversaries are members of the human race. Uh, in the case of Iraq, <clears throat> yes, undoubtedly Hussein was a tyrant, but one of the oldest uh, uh, pieces of wisdom regarding tyranny is that the tyrant is above all concerned with his self-preservation and wants his safety above all else. Of course, that gave us a means to deter aggressive action by Hussein if we'd wish to uh, pursue that course of action. We didn't. So, um, mind, heart, arms, legs, breath, uh, that's a useful way of thinking about American strategy. One thing that it helps us or points us in the direction of is that all of these things are really kind of mutually dependent. If your legs give out on you, it doesn't matter how, um, uh, how beautiful your mind is. And uh, if your heart fails, um, that's also a very serious uh, matter. And I th it seems to me that we've we've reached that point. We've reached a kind of limit in which our ambitions have gone beyond the ability of our body, as it were, to carry forth, and we need a reconsideration that brings us back to a more moderate conception of American aims in the world. Thank you.
And I ask that from the perspective of someone who uh, thinks that the Bush administration has been very inept in its own behalf in trying to enlist the, uh, the support of the American people and in, in preparing a military and a civil strategy in Iraq which would, uh, which would give them some chance of succeeding in their own objectives. And I, and I, and, uh, I ask that of anyone, but particularly for the pro-Bush uh, uh, advocate. Okay. Uh, um. Here's just my own take on it. Um, I think in, in the most immediate sense, the number one objective ought to be to uh, protect uh, those uh, Sunni loyalists, if you will, the, the Sunnis who are on our side. Uh, there's a recent analysis of what the incident uh, pattern in, in Iraq has been, and about 45% uh, of the attacks have been Sunni on Sunni violence. Uh, looked at from the insurgent point of view, these people are collaborationists. And a good indicator of this is the two Sunni members of the constitutional uh, panel who were executed. That, that's not so good to have that happen. Uh, so, and, and you know, that's certainly, I think, the most immediate objective is to try to make it safe for Sunnis to participate in the political reconstruction of Iraq. Uh, in the broader sense, I, I, I would think that my own personal view would be, uh, and if I can apply a just kind of a tactical analogy, that there's really very little that we can do to significantly accelerate the process of change in Iraq. So we're kind of in a hold on moment there. And we need to reposture ourselves militarily and politically uh, for the long run. And, and in doing so, um, I, I think that there's going to be a period of pause in the larger effort to, to uh, try to foment political change in the region. And that we should actually look elsewhere for opportunities uh, to, uh, uh, to help democratic forces such as in Lebanon uh, and it's, it's also worth, uh, uh, as I, I mentioned in my talk, trying to, to build um, a larger coalition that's going to be there for the long term. One of the most overlooked aspects of uh, Bush strategy making over the last couple of years has been uh, to, to uh, transform American relations with India, which I think will be, uh, again, over the, the long term an important component of a, of a successful strategy for the region. Spanish-American War. As a matter of fact, I think they are going to put something I wrote at the uh, website they told me. And I wonder if you can, if anybody agrees with that or, or, or uh, sees more parallels. I see Iraq more as, as a, as a long-term projection of the Spanish-American War than, than Vietnam, although like, it's, Vietnam is used very loosely to say that we are in quite mire in Iraq. And, and together with that, so the question is, in today's world, where we are globalized, uh, where terrorism can affect computer systems, uh, you don't need frontiers anymore, there are no boundaries. How, how does this expansionism uh, affect America's perimeter of defense? Where, where do you draw the line? And, and how would that tie up with any new doctrine or further doctrine of, of prevention? And, and the, 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 the failure of the UN role has also been said that um, the United States is not seen favorably around the world because it has break, uh, broken the law, it's not respecting international law. But 
there's very little debate about the failure of the UN as, as that organism that uh, we look to uh, for enforcement of international law. Sure. Uh, well, I, uh, I think there are a lot of par parallels with the Spanish-American War, probably more with the, uh, uh, the second phase of it, with the Philippine campaign rather than the first phase. The first phase of that war was really, it, it did have a, a kind of great humanitarian aspect to it. That was an awful civil war that was raging in Cuba. And so in that sense, uh, I, I think the connection with Iraq is fairly distant. But certainly in terms of the complications that uh, the United States subsequently encountered in the Philippines, there are some parallels. Uh, I, I don't think the prospects of pacifying Iraq are as good as the prospects of pacifying the Philippines. But there are a lot of similarities. You know, the, there was a big uh, a scandal over American atrocities in the conduct of that Filipino war that has followed absolutely the script of, uh, of these Iraqi problems in which, you know, Abu Ghraib is dismissed as an isolated a case of a bad, a few bad apples, and that was exactly what uh, American officials said with regard to similar charges in the case of the Philippine campaign. I mean, I think more generally there's a similarity in that there's this very curious conjunction between uh, insisting on the one hand that only the most selfless motives of Christian sacrifice and service uh, would justify such a war alongside uh, you know, obvious imperial interests and strategic interests that would be implicated by intervention. And so we have this very curious melding, as it were, of, of very highfalutin motives on the one hand and, and of uh, kind of strategic interests, oil, in the case of Iraq, bases in the case of the Philippines on the other. With regard to future American policy, well, I'll take a leaf from George Washington. Let us keep our commitments. Here, let us stop. Uh, I think that the United States does have a set of commitments uh, to Western Europe, to Japan, uh, that uh, are part of the overall architecture of uh, world order today. And it doesn't seem to me that it would serve any useful purpose to abandon those, to abandon the kind of relationships that we built up in the course of the Cold War. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to undertake a universal commitment to prevent aggression uh, everywhere, although it does seem to me that the world community in general does have an interest in ensuring that aggression does not succeed. And what that role would be, uh, I think, would have to be decided on the basis of uh, circumstances. I don't think there's any reason for thinking that our situation would be improved through uh, destabilizing all of these regimes in the Middle East. I just have a horror of, of, of the kind of uh, collapse and destabilization that might lead to. Uh, uh, the last time a, a regime collapsed in the Middle East in revolution in Iran in the, 17, uh, in the 1970s, you know, there was a crippling of world oil prices. And given the character of that world oil market today, <coughs> A collapse of Saudi production would, you know, could lead to a kind of economic catastrophe and collapse. That would be extremely dangerous. And I don't, just don't have any confidence that even though those regimes are unstable uh, and they're not democratic, that revolutionizing them is going to, is either legitimate on our part to do or in our interest to do. So, that's perhaps not a, a satisfactory answer in terms of charting an overall grand strategy for the United States, but you know, my, my position is not one of isolationism, but one of internationalism, and of allowing the United States to uh, commonly accepted principles of, of world order, albeit doing that somewhat prudently. Um, that, that kind of policy, too, as defensible as it may be, can also lead to difficulties, uh, as we saw in the case of, uh, as we saw in the case of Vietnam. So a very selective 
internationalism in terms of the use of mi American military power. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We are on a very tight schedule where we have to move now over to, to lunch. Thank you very much to this panel. That ends the fifth panel, but the program is not over for speakers and for those of you who RSVP'd for the lunch in the next room, please proceed there. Uh, we will be started in about seven or eight minutes uh, with the actual introduction of Mike Scheuer, so you'll want to uh, be seated over there. Thank you.